This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. You do have a new book, Thomas Jefferson Revolutionary, A Radical Struggle to Remake America. There's libertarians who go either way on Jefferson. Some think he's, he's a heroic, uh, you know, decentralizer as opposed to the Hamiltonian forces. Other people say, well, you know, he, he created, he helped create this constitution that we currently labor under now that seems so ill-libertarian. So tell us about the premise of your book and what you think about him. Well, first, Jefferson, uh, every semester I teach introductory classes in American history at my university. And I always tell the students, okay, I know that you think Thomas Jefferson wrote the Constitution and he wrote the Bill of Rights, but he didn't. He didn't have anything to do with it. He was in France. However, you're going to tell me on the final that he wrote the Constitution. And then every semester, students tell me on the final that he wrote the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson did not write the Constitution or have anything to do with writing the Constitution. In fact, we don't even know that he had anything to do with writing the 12th Amendment, which was actually authored by Republicans in Congress while he was president. Um, but I, my previous book, the one bef- immediately before this one, this is actually my fifth book, but the one immediately before this one was a biography of, of Jefferson's best friend in the world and closest political ally, James Madison. And I've had several people tell me that after reading that book, they didn't know whether I liked Madison which I take as a compliment, the, the besetting uh, temptation of people who write about particular uh, individuals is either to attack them or to laud them, and I try to do neither. So my book about Jefferson is not about why you should love him or why you should hate him. It's about his career as a radical, and he was a truly radical um, constitutional political reformer, beside which he also was responsible for for several other uh, initiatives that still affect us every day. So, for example, those decimal coins in your pocket, the idea that we should have a decimal coinage system was Jefferson's idea. In fact, America was the first country in the world that ever had a decimal coinage system. Now virtually every country, has, maybe actually every country has a a decimal coinage system, Jefferson's idea. Another idea that he had was that American public government buildings ought to be based on Greek and Roman uh, examples. This had not been true during the colonial period. Jefferson designed the capital of Virginia, which he he patterned on a a, um, Greek temple that he found in the south of France. And when he was president, when he was, I'm sorry, when he was secretary of state, he was involved in uh, laying out the, um, and ultimately when he was president, he was involved in laying out the design for the federal capital. Um, so there's, he also was the fellow who had the idea of moving the capital of Virginia from Williamsburg to Richmond. There are various other slight, um, kind of one-off reforms like that, that he was responsible for. Maybe, maybe the most important, um, achievement that he had at a stroke was that he was the one who had the idea in that immediately after the revolution began of abolishing Virginia's feudal land tenures. So you, your eyes are glazing over as I say that, but um, under English law at the time the revolution began, if a man died uh, and had a son, his oldest, uh, or if he had more than one child, his oldest son inherited his entire estate. That was called primogeniture. There also was a principle called entail, which was that an estate could not be divided by its current owner. So if you're the oldest son and you inherit 3,000 acres and they're entailed, you cannot during your lifetime sell them. And then if you have 12 sons, you can't decide, you know, the first one's a drunk, the second one's a wastrel, I'm going to give this stuff to the third one. No, it had to go to the first one. So one effect of this was that the whole body of your land holding would remain in that one pair of hands, generation after generation. Uh, a historian named Holly Brewer calculated about a decade, about two decades ago now, that at the time the revolution began, about two thirds of today's state of Virginia was owned by about 85 families. So in other words, about two thirds of today's state of Virginia only being owned by 85 families means that those 85 families owned on average 300 square miles each of Virginia. So Jefferson's abolition of primogeniture and entail uh, 
was absolutely essential to having a republic in society. Once that happened in 1776 and 7, um, these the states began to break up, and by the time Jefferson died, there were very few of these large estates left. And actually, maybe I should give you a little more of an idea. 300 square miles. My state of Connecticut has eight counties. 300 square miles is about half of a Connecticut county. So that means that 16 of these families would have owned an area of the entire state of today's Connecticut. These people were just fabulously wealthy. And the main part of the book, is about the long-running efforts that Jefferson made. So, for example, an effort on behalf of freedom of conscience, which after the two uh, Washingtonian principles that the generals are subordinate to the civilians and the chief executive is going to retire, um, freedom of, of conscience is perhaps our most important constitutional principle. And Jefferson was the, the chief person who was responsible for making it our most one of our most important constitutional principles. So I tell the story of his doing that in one chapter of the book. Another chapter of the book, the main chapter of the book, the longest one, is about federalism. For Jefferson, federalism was the principle that should be understood to underlie the British imperial constitution. And he based his argument against the King's intervention, the Parliament's intervention in North America in the 1760s and 70s on a claim that Virginia and other colonies each had a right to local self-government and their only legitimate tie to Britain was through the King. They had a common King. They didn't have a common Parliament. They had only a common King. After independence, which by the way, the Declaration of Independence is based on this idea of federalism too. You see the operative section says these colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that is not one nation, separate states in a federal relationship. During the Confederation period, Jefferson continued to insist on this principle of only limited um, allocation of authority to a center. And when the, when the federal constitution was created, Jefferson repeatedly found himself in a position of having to concoct ways that the states could resist encroachments by the federal government into state uh, reserved authority. This, in other words, his attitude about this general question didn't change from the imperial situation to the confederation to the U.S. Constitution. He always thought of Virginia as, and this is what he called it, my country, right? Even when he was president at one point, he wrote a document in which he referred to the federal government as, quote, our foreign government. Just think about that. So um, he he became famous in 1774 by arguing for this principle, and he still was arguing for it in 1825, right before he died. Um, there are a couple of chapters in the book about uh, demographic issues, what to do about slavery, what to do about the place of American Indians in American society. He had the idea that these people, like whites, were entitled to self-government, and so he um, had long, long careers kind of uh, on parallel tracks of trying to resolve these issues of what to do about slavery and what to do about the, uh, the place of Indians in North American society. And finally, last chapter of the book is about his idea that, well, if we have abolished these feudal land tenures, if we've broken up these landed estates, if we're not going to have this landed aristocracy to rely on to govern the Virginia, if we're not going to have generation after generation of George Mason and Patrick Henry's and George Washington and so on, then what are we going to have instead? And his solution was, well, the government, the state government ought to establish a system in which each community had uh, a local, what we would now call an elementary school, so that every free child, um, and that included in his language, he didn't say girls, but he said every child, so that included girls. Um, in fact, he didn't say that doesn't include blacks. Apparently, it included blacks. And at one point, uh, he got a letter from a Quaker reformer who was working on the idea of educating the slaves. And Jefferson said, well, there's no reason why that couldn't um, be inferred from the language of my bill for this purpose. Um, but anyway, he thought that each community ought to have a three-year um, public primary school 
And then at the end of those three years, the best student from each community ought to be selected to be sent at public expense to a regional uh, intermediate level school for three years. And finally, the best of those students ought to be selected each year to go on to William and Mary. So if you were wealthy, you could still send your kids to uh, the middle school and the William and Mary if you wanted to, but this was going to enable people beyond the few rich to send their kids to William and Mary. And actually in Colonial Virginia, there was no public education. Uh, there were no primary and secondary schools. And we think about half of Virginia men were illiterate when the revolution began. So Jefferson uh, had this idea of um, taking advantage of what he thought was probably a kind of random distribution of intellectual gifts across the population by calling out the few uh, most promising people and sending them on to William and Mary. Eventually, of course, he uh, kind of found himself at loggerheads with people at William and Mary because William and Mary was dominated by Episcopalians and they had a classic uh, curriculum based on the classical languages and and Jefferson thought, well, this is outmoded. And so he wanted to have thorough curricular reforms at William & Mary. But even as governor, when he was a member of the Board of Regents, he didn't get the kind of changes he wanted. So ultimately, he persuaded the legislature to create the University of Virginia. Virginia now, of course, is the best public uh, university in the country. But Jefferson's uh, university had a far more effect um, than that. That is, today we think, well, of course, Virginia has UVA and Arkansas has the University of Arkansas and Hawaii has the University of Hawaii. But really what's happened is that all the other universities in the country are based today on UVA as Jefferson conceived of it. So, for example, when UVA opened in 1821, I think it was, um, instruction there was not, and uh, the interaction between professors and students was not on the model of other colleges in the United States. If you were a student at Harvard in 1821, you would be given reading assignments. You would be expected to memorize extensive passages. When you went for class meetings, if the professor called on you, you would be expected to stand up and recite what you had memorized. This is, this is the way that grading was done. They would see how well you did in your recitation. Jefferson thought, this this was mindless, and what should happen instead was that people should be given essay examinations. Besides that, um, he didn't want the curriculum to be based on classical languages, which he thought were a kind of luxury, although he did love Greek and Latin. And when he was an old man, he'd ride around his horse for three miles a day. He always carried his... Um, he always carried his Plutarch in the original Greek in his pocket, but uh, he didn't think that this was useful. So Virginia was the first place where you could go and you could major in essentially anything you wanted. You could study any any curriculum you liked. And um, in fact, if you thought after a couple of years that you'd had enough schooling, you could leave. If five years later you thought you needed a little more, you could come back to UVA. So it was going to be a kind of an open thing. And, and besides that, the the living arrangements at UVA were different from the way they worked in, in say, English colleges or at Harvard at the time, where you, or at William & Mary, where you'd have a big building where all the students slept, and then the professors would live somewhere else. Instead, at UVA, you had um, small houses for professors uh, arranged around a central lawn and interspersed among the houses were living quarters for the students. Jefferson's idea was then that the, the class meetings would be on the ground floor of the professor's house. And so you'd have constant interaction among the students and professors. It would be, he called it an academical village. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be um, a hierarchical situation like what you'd have in Europe. Um, I could go on. This is, the thing is, um, it was just radically different from the old stilted, hierarchical, completely impractical, really mindless kind of instruction that went on in every other college in the in the world at the time. In fact, at Harvard, Jefferson was in correspondence in the 1820s with a professor at Harvard who decided he wanted to use UVA's instructional methods, but they weren't actually adopted at Harvard until the 1850s. Um, besides that, UVA was, according to the president of Yale at the time, was the only actual university in the country. 
UVA had the first medical professor in the country. They had a law school. They had uh, uh, the whole suite of different areas of instruction long before any other uh, post-secondary uh, institution in America could be called a university. So um, there are many ways in which it was different. And as, I, as I've been saying these things, I'm sure you thought, well, where well, I went to college, you know, that's how we did, of course. And again, Virginia was revolutionary in all these ways. And Jefferson had a freakish role in creating UVA too. Not only did he conceive of it, but then he chose the professors. He does, he was a fabulous architect. He drew all the buildings. He oversaw the construction. He and his friend James Madison chose the books for the library. And I don't mean in general they we need to get 300 books on you know French history. No, they chose actual titles. Um, Jefferson had his finger in every pie, and it, it really was um, his baby. In, in a way that no other college has ever anywhere been anyone's baby. It's, it's an amazing story. Why did he do this? Well, because again, he thought if you're going to have a Republic, you wanted the most able child to be able to have the advantage of a good education so that um, even if his father were a poor, illiterate backwoods person, the society would have the advantage of that young man's talents. And, this was just radically egalitarian. So um, I think people who, who say, well, Jefferson, uh, he's not worthy of uh, our consideration are just mistaken. I don't want to be understood as saying that I think he uh, was without flaws, but that's not what this book is about. It's not a biography. Instead, it's, again, it's a study of his radical statesmanship, which in the book, I call the most significant career of radical statesmanship in American history. It's, it's got its effect on us every day. You know, we're not going to have gays thrown off buildings. We're not going to have um, honor killings. We're not going to have um, people punished for their religion or have uh, you know barrel bombs dropped on us for having the wrong uh, subscription to some theological uh, position. And it's not, of course, solely Jefferson's legacy that that's true, but again, I think it's more his doing than anyone else's. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we'd be talking with Professor Kevin Gutzman. His new book is called Thomas Jefferson Revolutionary, A Radical Struggle to Remake America. Thanks so much for a fascinating discussion of all things constitutional, and ladies and gentlemen, you have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.